Hey everyone, welcome to Kai Bomo Music. This is a new series of mine where we'll be taking a look at a lot of music related things, whether it be reviews, things that have to do with my collection, like getting new stuff or just showing you guys my collection. For today's video, I want to take a look at a band that I believe deserved so much more success than they actually ended up getting. This band had kind of a softer pop sound when they first started out that kind of made them drift into obscurity because a lot of the popular stuff at the time, being the late 80s, kind of overshadowed it, being more high energy and successful in the charts. The band I'm talking about today is none other than Fraser Chorus, one of the most obscure late 1980s bands that I know of. They had a pretty short career, so their discography is not a lot to go through. But regardless, there's a lot of hidden gems in there, which is why I'm making this video. I really wish I had physical copies of this music, but considering a lot of it wasn't even released in the United States where I live, I'm just gonna have to show you guys pictures of the music right here. Isn't that cool? So without further ado, let's get into a quick history of the band Fraser Chorus. Fraser Chorus first started out on 4AD, the alternative music label, in 1987. 4AD is considered by many to be one of the most important alternative music labels of all time. I mean, they had Cocteau Twins and Dead Can Dance, so they were a big deal. When Fraser Chorus were on 4AD, they only put out one release, which is their 12-inch Sloppy Heart. The first track on the record is called Sloppy Heart. I mean, what else would it be called? Sloppy Heart is like a nearly six minute long, really extravagant pop single. The song has the first appearance of the band's signature style, which consists of really whispery vocals from the lead vocalist slash frontman slash songwriter, Tim Freeman. One of the other defining aspects of this song, and just the band's music in general, is the flute playing of Kate Holmes. There weren't very many bands back in the 80s who said that they had a flutist as a member, but Fraser Chorus, they were just different like that. The lyrics of this song describe a summertime train ride in which the main character has to sit next to someone who, I presume by the lyrics, he really has the hots for. There's a lot of tense and intimate moments, and Tim Freeman, the songwriter, uses a lot of words like sloppy and squishy to describe the main character's heart, which, at first, I was just like, that's kind of cheesy, but eventually, as I was listening to it more, I kind of started to like it. Like, this is unique. You don't really hear pop music with this kind of lyrics. I guess that's just how Tim Freeman's writing style is. It seems kind of cheesy and forward, but at the same time, it's a little bit cryptic. Like, half the time you can't even be 100% sure about the meaning of what he's singing. And that can be said for a lot of this band's songs. Now the B-side of this record is a total roller coaster. It starts off with the track Typical, which is a lot more poppy and upbeat than the first track. I'd have to say a lot less dramatic too. That first track almost ends in kind of an atmospheric way, which is pretty cool, but Typical is quite the departure from that. I feel like if Typical was released as an A-side for this particular record, 4AD would have had a lot more of a success on their hands. But yeah, this song is really characteristic of when it came out, which is the late 1980s, which is honestly quite different from a lot of the music that succeeded it in the early 90s, you know, grunge. Just like the A-side though, Typical still has that flute, that really distinct flute, and those vocals and the songwriting that were present on the first track. When you're listening to it, you're just kind of thinking to yourself, okay, so this is how the band sounds. But then all of a sudden, the second track on the B-side, Storm, just takes that and throws it away. It's quite a change of pace. It's a lot darker than the first two songs. I mean, the first track, Sloppy Heart, has kind of a little bit of darkness to it, but Storm takes that and turns it up to 11. If they put out more tracks like the track Storm, they would have been a big hit with the 4AD audience. 4AD audience, but yeah, Storm is probably their darkest sounding song in like their whole discography. And that basically sums up the band's first release. And unfortunately, it was their last release with 4AD, like I said. That record didn't really have any success when it came to the UK charts, but fans of Fraser Chorus, myself included, really fondly remember it. Within a year of putting out that single, they actually signed a record deal with a much bigger record label, Virgin Records. The release date is kind of inconsistent, but sometime in 1988 or early 1989, they put out their first single with Virgin, Dream Kitchen. It's another upbeat song like Typical, but with much more cryptic lyrics. Like, you can't tell if he's actually singing about a kitchen or if he's singing about, like, something metaphorical. I don't know. Personally, I kind of see the song as, like, not focusing too much on your dreams, so you can kind of keep reality in check. But I don't know. I'm sure that it's up to interpretation. This song actually has a really good vibraphone solo, which can't really be said about a lot of 80s songs. Like, I know there's uh, 
Art of Noises Moments in Love that has the brum. You know what I'm talking about if you know that song. But yeah, it has a vibraphone solo, and it's really good. The single was their first success. It actually charted at number 57 on the UK singles chart. That wasn't the biggest accomplishment at the time, but it was for the band, because with their first record, they didn't have much success. After Dream Kitchen came out, re-recorded versions of the songs from the 4AD single, Sloppy Heart, and Typical were released. The re-recorded version of Typical actually charted even higher than Dream Kitchen, getting a 53 on the UK charts. I don't know if I like the re-recorded version of Typical better than the original, but it's still pretty good and it still has the overall Frasier Chorus vibe to it, which I really like. But the new version of Sloppy Heart just doesn't do it for me. It's a lot more rhythmic in places where it doesn't need to be and it just kind of obliterates the original mood of the first version. The first version was so dramatic, the song kind of creeps up on you. At first it's just kind of a mellow song, but then eventually there's more build up and so on. If you listen to it, you're gonna know what I mean. And it also has some backing vocals at parts that I don't really think need them. That's just my opinion. It still did chart on the UK singles, but it actually got like a 73, which was much lower than typical in Dream Kitchen. All three of these Virgin singles actually have really good B-sides. I really like the B-side in Dream Kitchen, which is called Down, and all three of the exclusive B-sides on the Sloppy Heart single. One of the Sloppy Heart B-sides is actually a cover of Anarchy in the UK by Sex Pistols, and it's just so good. It's so dramatic that it's kind of funny. In my opinion, it's one of the best tracks to play if you're trying to introduce someone you know to Fraser Chorus. But yeah, be sure to check out all those B-sides. After those three singles were released on Virgin, it was apparent that the band was heading in a lot more poppy direction. I'm not sure if that was a choice made by the band or by the record label. Knowing Virgin being one of the biggest record labels at the time, I'm sure that they were trying to push them along, like, come on, let's make more of a poppy sound so you can chart higher and make us more money. But yeah, next up, their first LP, called Sue, was released on Virgin Records in 1989. Sue actually borrowed a lot of the tracks from the previous singles. If I had to describe this LP in two words, it would be English Summertime. I've never been to England, but these tracks give me such a summertime vibe. And because of how British Tim Freeman sounds with his voice and his lyrics, I just have to connect the British aspect to that. They actually re-recorded the song Storm for this album. Unlike the other songs, I actually like this new re-recorded version even more than the original. It's just the drums. The new drums on the song are so powerful. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just as good as the original and more. There's another song on this LP that has kind of a similar vibe to Storm. And it almost goes into like 90s Depeche Mode territory, and it's called Forgetful. Forgetful perfectly encapsulates the Fraser chorus sound. It's just the instrumentation, the feel, and the lyrics that just make it, you know, Fraser chorus. In the lyrics, there's like a bitter and sarcastic edge to it that's just so Tim Freeman. And it's one of the reasons why I like this band. It's a big reason why I like this band. It's because of songs like that that Sue is actually my favorite Fraser chorus record. And there's other songs like 40 Winks and Sugar High that sound like a 90s point-and-click adventure computer game. Like you're trying to sneak around and solve a mystery. I don't know what makes it like that. I guess it's just kind of the sort of jazzy, old-school sounding feel to it. And I guess the MIDI instruments kind of contribute to that. Just I highly recommend listening to this band's entire discography. There's not much of it and it's just so good. Now the vinyl version of this LP ends with the track Ski Head. And honestly, it's a great closer track. It feels like a good exit for the album, if you know what I mean. The CD and cassette versions of Sue have a bonus track called Little Chef, and it's just such a chilled, adventurous, summery sounding song that I just, oh, it's so relaxing and it reminds me of adventures and just times that I've never had. It would honestly be a great closer track, just like Ski Head. Overall, I just really enjoyed this album, and if you had to listen to one Fraser Chorus album, I would say listen to Sue. Which is easy, because it's actually on Spotify, unlike their last album. When I was first listening to this album, I was like, okay, this is kind of unique, I think I'm gonna actually like this once I listen to it more. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, a similar thing kind of happened to me when I was listening to the discography of uh, Prefab Sprout. But that's another video for another time. Sue did pretty okay on the UK album chart. It got number 56, which is still pretty good. It means that there was a pretty big amount of interest in the band at the time. It actually ended up being their highest charting album. Honestly, I feel like this album deserved better. I feel like they were kind of pushed by the record label to create more of a poppy sound when they could have created more songs like Storm. I really would have liked that. Like Storm and Forgetful. 
But yeah, the band trying to be trendy actually brings us to our next thing to talk about, which is their second LP, Ray. Now, Ray had four singles, and it had two singles that did really well. Those singles being Cloud 8 and Nothing. Not only did these chart in the UK, but they also charted in the United States, albeit on the alternative and dance music charts. So I guess starting off, Cloud 8 is this incredibly catchy pop tune. It's kind of nostalgic for me for some reason, which I don't really know why, because I don't know how I would have been exposed to this song, but when I was first listening to it, I was like, wait, have I heard this before? It just was vaguely familiar to me. And honestly, I don't think I had heard it before at that time. I think it was just the kind of sound that you really don't hear anymore. Because of that, I guess it just kind of reminds me of things that I've heard in the past. Cloud 8 actually has a great trumpet solo, which kind of made my ears perk up because I actually played trumpet for six years. I guess that's a little fact about me. Moving on, the other successful single from this album, Nothing, is very EDM sounding. It's very electronic sounding, unlike a lot of their other music. When you're listening to the song Nothing, if you know the band Pulp, you're probably thinking, wait, did Jarvis Cocker listen to this? Because it's just so similar to the kind of music that came out on the Pulp album, Separations, which came out quite a bit after this. Nothing actually became the band's highest charting single in the UK, because it got 51. Which still kind of surprises me. Like, I would think that a band that had this kind of sound in the UK in the early 90s would chart a lot higher. Both of those singles have really great b-sides, a couple of which are actually in French. Like, when I was first listening to them, I was like... Is this in French? Sure enough, it's in French. Anyway, sometime around when those two singles came out, the band's second LP, Ray, released. It actually charted to 66, which is 10 places lower than Sue. Which still surprises me, because like I said, I think that a band that had this sound in the UK would have done a lot better. It has a lot more poppy and electronic type sounds than the first album. My two favorite tracks on this LP are Walking on Air and Here He Comes Again. The first of which has kind of like an airy feel to it. it. Really makes you feel like you're walking on air, like it was a great title for the song. And then the second one, Here He Comes Again, is without a doubt the darkest song on this album. While the lyrics aren't the most dark thing in the world, it has probably my favorite use of this band's unique instrumentation. With the clarinet, just the menacing sound that they were able to get out of it is just so amazing. And it's one of the reasons why I have gone on to remember this band instead of just listening to their albums once and just being like, eh, okay. And that basically sums up how I feel about Fraser Chorus' second LP. Well, it's still a really good record, it's still probably my least favorite of theirs. That's mainly because of it having, as a whole, a kind of less unique sound than the other two albums. That album would actually be the last release by Fraser Chorus on Virgin Records. Because Virgin Records was actually merging with another record label because it got bought out. According to an interview that I read with Tim Freeman, they were actually high on the list of the 60 least wanted musicians that were still on the Virgin label. Which might have been a blessing in disguise. Because honestly, if they were in fact getting pushed around by Virgin Records, that probably wasn't a good environment for them. Which might explain why all of the band members except for Tim Freeman actually left after this record came out. During the years after the departure from Virgin Records, they would actually record some demos. These demos would eventually be released under the name Monkey Spunk, special thanks to the partially official Fraser Chorus website in 1998. Out of these demos, the favorite one of mine is probably called So You're Sorry. It has this really acoustic, kind of Smith sounding vibe to it, and it's pretty melancholic too, but yeah. It's just a very unique song by Fraser Chorus standards. If you could only listen to one of their demo songs, I'd recommend that one. The demos are pretty rare, but I was actually able to track down most of them, so I'll make sure to put those up on my YouTube channel. Anyway, moving on chronologically, we're on to this band's last album, which is called Wide Awake. It was released in 1995 as a mini-album on the UK's Pinkerton Records, and it only had eight tracks, and it technically wasn't long enough to be an album. A year later, in 1996, it was released on the American record label Pure Records, with some extra songs and a different mix on one of the tracks. For this album, Tim Freeman actually recruited more musicians to work on the album, such as the drummer Benny DeMassa, who was known for working on Cocteau Twins' album For Calendar Cafe. The LP is pretty down-tempo and relaxed, mostly. It's got some really chilled out tracks like If the Weather Was Up To Me and Here We Are. The album is really quite different than the other two LPs, partially because it had been a while since they actually recorded something, and partially because most of the original members left. In my opinion, Freeman's songwriting had actually evolved a little bit by the time that this album came out. Maybe it had something to do with not being part of one of those big evil record companies, 
But still, very well done and a very good way to finish off the entirety of Fraser Chorus. So that's essentially all I know about Fraser Chorus. You think they'll ever release more material? Probably not. But anything's possible. Hey everyone. What you just watched was the most complicated video I've ever edited. So if you've made it this far, I want to thank you so much for sticking around. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about this video. So if at all possible, please leave a comment below saying what you thought. In the description box, I have some links related to this video, such as my five must-listen Fraser Chorus songs. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching this video, and please remember to leave feedback. See you in the next one!